So um, let me begin with our project, uh, Beatles project. Project. It's really it's a program financed by Horizon Europe. Um, it's going to last for four years. So we are slightly over one year into the project. So, uh, but still there are already first results um, and some of them are really interesting because it shows that um, there's a lot of work to do um, that, you know, our food system will be more sustainable as it is. Um, we are 18 partners across uh, 10 uh, European countries. So, and our project actually aspires to change the way our food uh, system currently operates. And um, we will try to accelerate the systematic and systemic behavioral shift to climate smart agriculture and smart farming technologies. So um, I think it's, there's no doubt that the current EU food system is unsustainable on many counts. It's both affected by and a major driver of climate change, pollution and waste, loss of biodiversity and diet related non-communicable diseases such as obesity and diabetes. So I think that EU food systems has severe environmental and social impacts abroad um, and we need to start um, change, we must change the course um, to uh, stop these climate changes. So um, as I said, the project, um, the Beatles project, we want to achieve that every food uh, value chain will be viewed as a system of interlinked components. Um, so, uh, and for that, Beatles is doing the targeted selection of agri food value chains across the EU and by engaging multiple stakeholders in co creation or systematic innovation. So, we really want to include everyone in each part of the uh, agri food value chain because, as I said, no one should be, should be left uh, outside. So the project will provide an integrative inventory of behavioral insight about the full range of lock-ins and layers that hinder or motivate uh, these changes, including uh, individual, systematic, and policy factors. So the, if I just you know, go quickly over the overall objective, is actually to propose innovative um, systematic solutions based on insight to encourage long-term and large-scale transitions to sustainable, productive, and climate-smart agriculture food system. And as I mentioned, the consortium is really impressive, but since I'm coming from Slovenian Consumer Association, I will focus more on consumers and farmers, both very important parts of food system. Because um, to simplify, uh, if farmers do not produce products in a sustainable way, consumers cannot even buy them. Or if farmers produce such products, but consumers do not buy them for various reasons, farmers will not insist on doing so. So we will quickly look at uh, what are the key barriers, restraints, and incentives for farmers to resist smart farming practices. And of course, on the other side, for consumers not to use these products or to buy these products more often. But before I start with this, um, besides, you know, doing different um, surveys, we will also have experiments um, in, within the Beatles project. We will have validation of business models. We are working really strong on policy recommendation. And of course, uh, we, we know that it's very important to, you know, to achieve knowledge transfer. But uh, let me start with the results, um, with the main results of systematic literature review that show different factors that affect farmers' transition to climate smart agriculture. So here are some uh, basic um, sociodemographic factors uh, like older age, low education, low youth income, low farming experience, and part-time occupation. These are really some big sociodemographic factors seen as barriers. On the other side, side we have also barriers among um, psychological factors, for example, low, low awareness, low skills and capacity, low innovat innovativeness and low environmental consciousness. So we need to actually work more on uh, motivation to, by economic gains. We should you know, overcome the negative attitudes. Uh, we should overcome the resistance to change and of course also to risk aversion. 
Um, for example, we have also then uh, systemic factors. Um, as we uh, find out, um, farmers are very affected by social norms, peer-to-peer -peer learning, social networking, membership in a cooperative, and advisory uh, services. So we should use all this knowledge actually um, to show the drivers uh, that um, climate smart agriculture practices and uh, or technologies will be used uh, by farmers. So um, as we can say, uh, we find out that um, it's very important for them that these practices are useful, they are easy to use, they are compatible with their um, with, uh, practices they are using right now. They are not too expensive. They can see benefits, and they they, they trust these um, practices. And with all this, um, based on this outcome, it's evident that policies and strategies will need to be implemented to assure that farmers' transition to climate smart agriculture will overcome overcome all these barriers and um, actually promote these climate smart uh, agriculture practices. So uh, we, uh, within uh, Bitter's project, we pre prepare some recommendation for policies and strategies. So um, to attract young people to work in agriculture, as they are usually more open to innovative practices, to provide more, more governmental financial support to disadvantaged farmers with low income, to actually offer a combination of voluntary schemes for the more environmentally conscious farmers, and actually also mandatory schemes for the more risk averse farmers. Um, we are sure that we also need to design communication campaigns uh, to raise farmers' awareness about the negative environmental impact of agriculture and the benefits um, in the case of transition to climate smart agriculture. Um, I think we should focus, um, the strategy should focus um, to design climate smart solution that are cost and risk effective and have clear environmental and social benefits. Um, definitely um, the role of advisor to provide reliable, practical and scientifically um, founded advice to farmers should be strengthened. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning and learning by doing are also very important. And of course, we should increase the availability of capacity building activities through farmer networks, farmer association, um, NGOs, and of course, uh, formal education programs. So this is quickly the overview of uh, factors affecting farmers' transition. But now if we go um, at the end of this chain to consumers, we will see that there are also quite few uh, barriers um, which prevent, if I say, or stop consumers for buy, uh, from buying these um, environmentally friendly food products. So in, this, in the aspect of socio demographic factors, um, the review has shown that older consumers, men, consumers with lower education, lower income, and consumers who are living in areas with lower awareness are less likely to adopt in a, um, environmental friendly diet. And also if we check the psychological factors, uh, we can see that um, consumers who have more knowledge are more likely to make, to make environmentally friendly choices. The same was found for the individuals who are used to buying um, this kind of product and consumers who are open to new experience. We can see that also here it's very important that um, consumers are, are ready to change their diet. It's the same with farmers. They should be ready to change the, uh, the way they are working right now. And it's the same with consumers. They should you know, uh, understand that um, unhealthy lifestyle, that uh, more sustainable food diet, it's better for them. But they should see this benefit um, on concrete cases, like for example, um, health um, and so on. So if I go on with the product characteristics, um, they also affect consumer behavior shift towards environmental friendly uh, food. So uh, information on the packaging, such as claims, certification, and information about the origin, environmental impact of production, and animal welfare, they all increase the purchase chances uh, from consumers' point of view. 
also uh, lower price, lower price, longer expiry date, appealing taste and appearance, perception of natu naturalness, high quality and food, food safety. They also present important drivers for consumers, uh, willingness to pay for um, this kind of environmental friendly product. Uh, for me, it's very, um, it would be interesting to hear actually what consumers understand under natural ingredients. Because, you know, these are words and, um, and I'm sure that if we ask each of us, uh, we would understand different what should stand behind this um, word. Um, and so also here uh, we can say that um, systematic factors such as social norms have been detected as an important factor um, influencing consumers' behavior, but also um, advertising, promoting, and encouraging um, environmentally friendly consumption um, through various information sources has shown a positive impact on, on environmental friendly food consumption. And lastly, policy factors, we cannot forget about them. Um, government action supporting the growth and accessibility of um, environmental friendly food um, can have an effect on consumer willingness to buy such products. Because um, as a consumer organization, um, if I can add this point, we always say the um, environmental friendly um, diet should be easy diet. So the consumers um, should not have, have shouldn't have any problems with buying this product. This should be their first first choice. So this product should, should be on shelves in the store where they are usually buying, um, you know, everyday uh, food products. So um, also for the consumers, we also prepare some um, recommendation um, how to achieve this consumer behavior shift towards um, for, uh, to buy more friendly food products. And as uh, it's again um, to educate consumers um, about the environmental and health benefits to promote and encourage this kind of consumption behavior as a social norm to actually ensure better availability and accessibility um, to stimulate dem demand for environmental friendly foods um, through marketing campaigns and demonstrate their value for many money to um, help consumers to make more um, informed choices by implementing a labeling system that provides transparent information about products, ingredients, and their environmental and health impact. And of course, also offer tax incentives for sustainable practices and um, government subsidies for climate smart agricultural producer, producers to lower the cost of this kind of products. Um, because we are all consumers, we can see that, you know, usually these products are more expensive, but not always. So if we want to persuade consumers to buy this kind of products, we should come closer with the price because this should not be just products for a small group of people who can afford to buy these kind of products. Um, we also uh, made a survey uh, and these findings that were already mentioned um, and they were done by systematic review were also compared uh, with a survey done among farmers and consumers. Um, this first survey was done um, in six countries and actually um, I won't actually repeat it once again, but yes, it, it showed that, for example, um, on the farmer side, that income level, education level, farm size, and farm ownership were found to be positively correlated with climate smart agriculture adoption intention, that the age of farmers was negatively correlated, and also we saw that positive interdependence of the adoption intention and perception of self-responsibility and farm motives. Motives. So, if um, the farmer understands, you know, his role um, in this path, you know, to um, climate change, he will be more um, willing to change his practices, the way he is working on farm. Um, of course, farmers, um, they are um, the more farmers are willing to take risk. Um, the more they will be willing to take to adopt climate smart agriculture. So this also means that you know that farms uh, which are financially stable are more willing to adopt this kind of um, 
technologies. Um, so um, policy institutional framework, again, incentives, this is something that um, really legislation should work on it. And um, if we move on um, to the decision-making factors for consumers, um, on, for the consumers, it was also the survey done in six countries and the key findings, um, as I said, also, um, they um, confirmed the, what we already uh, confirmed during the systematic review that um, on average the respondents agreed that they are willing to buy environmental friendly products, but they are often actually asking if their um, effort it's it's worth. Does it make any change um, to the whole uh, problem? So uh, consumers should know and should feel and should understand that you know it's important that they are buying this kind of product. They should feel that their um, purchase counts. So this, that's why, of course, these campaigns are very important. So um, at the end, instead of um, conclusion, I would say that um, sustainable healthy diets are a win-win for health, climate, and food security. Um, however, um, consumers actually struggle to align food habits with sustainable and, uh, and healthy eating goals. Why? Um, because if we look um, what actually shape our, um, let's say, food choices, what actually we buy, it's not us, it's their retailers, because it's very important, you know, what ads we see uh, when we come to store, um, you know, what is the product placement? So the food environment, um, the food availability and price, and all these shapes actually our choices. Um, we often say that consumers, we have illusion of choice. No, we don't actually decide uh, what we will buy. Yes, we do buy at the end, but the whole food environment actually, you know, drive us toward, toward uh, certain uh, food choices. And for us, it's important that eating healthy and sustainable should, should become the first, the regular choice. So not something that you should navigate through the shelves in the store, but this choice should be, you know, easy to find, should be visible, and of course should be um, also in the price range that we can afford. Uh, afford. So the EU, EU policymakers must take action to enable consumers to shift to plant-based and higher welfare products. So this is quickly the quick overview of some of the Beatles project results. Um, I don't know if you have any question. Um, our webpage, uh, Beatles project uh, pro um, webpage, is really a uh, very important source of information. And also, if you are interested on, on our use cases, um, this is the right place to go and check the web page and find more about other um, pro um, project results. Well, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to, to, to participate in this workshop, but in particular to, to join this uh, network of projects you are uh, creating uh, around the, the Maya the Maya project. The, what I will tell you is very much in line with what has been presented earlier, because it is a project that belongs that, that responded to the same call. We are uh, Beatles and uh, Visionary, our sister projects, together with our third one, responded to the same call. In uh, in our case, the, the project Visionary is the the acronym of the, the title that is Food Provision Through Sustainable Farming Systems and Value Change. This is the call we responded to. It is a real project. This is a research and innovation uh, action in which we are uh, 13 partners from eight different countries. We started a bit uh, later than, uh, than than Beatles, so I am afraid I will not uh, I will not be able to to tell you, to show you so many results and outcomes. We are, the first year we have tried to, to build the conceptual and analytical uh, basis for the empirical research we are starting uh, right now. So I will show you, I will try to respond to the three topics you ask us uh, in terms of what we plan to do or what we are uh, trying to, to implement. Well, you have here the map of the participants. I'm here in, in Valencia. 
So we are the, the coordinators and we are we are sharing the scientific coordination with the University of uh, Aberdeen in the uh, Scotland. So the, the, the aims of, of the project of, are very much in line to uh, to the Beatles one. Uh, we aim to first to to characterize and uh, assign the, the relative relevance to the, the different behavioral factors that are conditioning that are shaping uh, food actors uh, decision making uh, from farmers to consumers all along the, the food uh, change and how to utilize those uh, this uh, knowledge in order to overcome the existing barriers and lockings that are preventing many of the actors to take uh, decisions that are better in terms of uh, environmental but also social uh, sustainability we want to to to, to link this uh, relationship between consumers and farmers because there is as uh, it was said sometimes we uh, those people working on the agricultural domain uh, forget about the, the the end of the of the value chain and the role of consumers in shaping also farmers' uh, choices. We also aim to 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 contribute to the design of uh, targeted policies. Uh, I will uh, speak later about uh, behavioral uh, food policies, but also we aim to adopt a, a focus on the on the role of collective collective entities in in in. The, in overcoming some of the barriers uh, for the adoption of sustainable practices. We are running, and I will go back to this point later on, uh, a number of uh, what we have called science policy interfaces as uh, multi-actor platforms in which we want to, to put in practice the, the, the transdisciplinary approach of the project. We aim to, we ambition to identify policies that would be able to, uh, sorry, uh, policies that uh, instead of uh, facilitating the transition towards more sustainable food systems are acting uh, in, in practice as barriers, and who are the actors who could change them. And as, as an, a research project, we also want to, to, to pay attention to the combination of more experimental methods in, in analyzing uh, individuals' behavior, but also with combined with a, a system approach, because what we have found, and uh, this is one of the parting points of the project, is that there are sometimes some, uh, I would say, sectoral silos that are preventing many actors to take into account what is happening in the rest of the of the food system. And here I'm trying to address the three questions you ask us. Well, first, regarding the, the problems that the project is, is addressing, are, uh, it was very much aligned with the the, the acknowledged uh, ecological footprint of the food system in terms of water, in terms of biodiversity uh, degradation, in terms of obviously uh, greenhouse gases emissions. We all know that uh, the food system is uh, responsible for around a third of all uh, emissions from uh, human activity. So this is a, a huge uh, challenge. The second point is that despite the, the evidence, uh, food actors, and here I'm adopting this value chain approach from, from farmers to consumers, keep making inadequate decisions. They are choices, they are uh, developing practices, they are establishing relationships that are not in line with the sustainability of the, of the food system. And there are a number of factors that are uh, explaining them, and it, uh, Jasmina presented, presented some, some of them. The point is that, there is a need, there is a necessity to better understand these factors, not only to, to, to be able to, to explain them, but to also to design uh, interventions at both the public and the private levels to overcome these barriers and lockings. I mean, the, the, the aim is not only to, to understand which are the factors explaining or preventing the adoption, but to design innovative interventions in both the public and the private spheres in order to overcome this, uh, these barriers and lockings. The, the the solutions that are being explored and that will be explored in in many cases because as I told you we are still launching this the empirical part of the of the project is uh, on the one hand to to design better targeted public and private behavioral interventions. Uh, there, are, for instance, we, we are we uh, we uh, we will explore to what extent, for instance, consumers who are the good consumers they are more sensitive to messages regarding the environmental dimension of food or healthy friendly products or tasting because sometimes we can use uh, innovative recipes in order to to 
to uh, to shape somehow to 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 bring consumers to 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 make the, the right decisions when they go to the supermarket or, or to the to the groceries. Uh, to what extent they are more sensitive to messages regarding the 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 provenance of the origin, the geographical origin origin of the of the of the food. This is a this debate about this locally or territorial uh, territorial based uh, products. Okay, this is we are trying to understand if we want to promote this more environmentally friendly uh, consumer habits diets, which is the the the, the best the best way to address this uh, this objective. It is uh, the the message should be about the environment, it should be about the health. This is the kind of interventions we, we want to, to test. And similarly for the farmers, which are the, the in terms, for instance, of uh, policy interventions, there are a number of uh, policies uh, trying to promote farmers' adoption of more sustainable practices. I mean, we have uh, compulsory, practice, compulsory regulations, we have public payments, we have labeling schemes, how to combine them to overcome some of the barriers that are preventing most of the farming community to adopt these more uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, decisions or uh, practices. Secondly, we want to, uh, we will pay uh, attention to the collective modalities of adoption of sustainable practices. For us, this is also a, a, an essential part of the project to understand not, not only the, the individual's behavior, but the, the collective ways in order to to uh, to adopt to promote these uh, practices to work uh, and to adopt uh, to work with the, the food actors adopting this system thinking uh, approach in order to to better understand and navigate the, the complexity of the food system overcoming sometimes i mean in many cases we have found that uh, food actors farmers processors retailers even consumers Operate in a very, uh, I would say, sectoral silos, not taking into account the complexity and the, the amount of interactions. We are developing activities and we will develop activities in order to, to overcome these this, uh, frontiers, in order to put together different kind of actors in order to, 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 to make evident, the, even in many cases, the, the necessity to, to cooperate. And finally, I would like to, to emphasize this Double uh, uh, adoption. First, this is a, an interdisciplinary project because we have we are in into the consortium uh, people coming from the uh, from sociology, from the economics, uh, geographers, uh, engineers, but also we uh, are adopting a transdisciplinary approach because we are working from the very beginning with the actors uh, in order to to make use of this uh, expertise. From the the the, uh, the the who are expected to be the end users of our outcomes, to to be from the very beginning engaged in the project or to propose their own solutions that are going to be tested later in the empirical uh, analysis to to be done. We are uh, we will work because this is uh, something that is starting right now uh, in thirty four different case studies that are grouped in uh, what we have, we have called thematic clusters. That these clusters uh, revolve around both environmental specific environmental challenges or selected actors. I will show you this. This is a kind of map of the case studies in which we will uh, conduct our uh, empirical research. There are some cases in which we are going to work with the farming community uh, about organic biodiversity, and we are in some cases to work directly with consumers. And uh, we have a num two main case studies that adopt a more a value chain approach in which we are working with a diversity of uh, value chain actors from producers to consumers, processors, retail, retailers, and, and so on. You have here the, well, you can see the, uh, the, the, the countries in which uh, we will uh, implement these case studies. And the, in orange, you have the, the, the partner who will coordinate, who will lead in relation to climate change, because it's very much about the, it's about the, put it in line with the with the workshop, we have some cases of studies about organic food, in which organic production that, that is very much in line, for instance, with the um, accumulation of organic matter in soil. We have some cases directly lead, uh, dealing with uh, carbon. Uh, on the one hand, the adoption of farmers of uh, 
uh, carbon farming practices. In other cases, the certification of uh, carbon neutrality in the case of in that case in the case of uh, uh, milk production. And also there is a, 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 a third uh, topic that is the transition towards plant-based proteins that will be uh, tackled in, in three different case studies at different levels, working with different uh, actors, because this is one of the, of the transitions that is uh, closely linked to the reduction of uh, gas emissions from the food uh, system. A part of this empirical research, we are uh, we have implemented and we are running what we have called this uh, science policy interfaces that are operating at the local, regional, and national level, depending on, on the case. There are a total of sixteen cases in which there are as uh, multi-actor pl platforms in which we have the, the, the scientific community, but also policy making and also other stakeholders, private stakeholders that participate as well in the uh, in the policy processes. In order to explore, uh, to, to, to analyze uh, and to assess the proposed uh, interventions, we are working with them in order to identify which would be the interventions to be tested in the empirical uh, research. Because these SPIs are for us uh, a spaces to co-construct knowledge. Knowledge it is a, a space of, in order to, to get information, to get their in science, their needs about the the constraints they are facing. Obviously, these uh, platforms are uh, key dissemination channels for us, but also we want some of them to to be a kind of exploitation devices, as. Uh, our mission is that in some of these SPIs, we uh, aim to to implement some of the solutions that are going to be uh, uh, proposed and analyzed in the course of the project. As I told you, we have no yet uh, big novelties in terms of uh, expected outcomes, uh, but we we will work in two main domains. First, that of the policy recommendations in terms of particular behavioral food policies, how to use behavioral knowledge in order to design better policies, in order, in order to, to design policies able to overcome the, the barriers that are preventing many actors to, to, to make the, the right choices in terms of environmental sustainability, and the realm of uh, sustainable business models, how to even linked to, to the policies, the impact of policies, how businesses all along the food chain from uh, production to retail and could improve, uh, could uh, adopt uh, sustainable uh, oriented innovations, working in a, in a relational perspective, I mean, working together with the others. And we want to understand to what extent the adoption of these uh, business models is going to condition is, is linked to the adoption by others of, uh, of different practices also in terms of uh, sustainability. This is a final scheme trying to synthesize the, the visionary approach in which, as I told you, the first thing we have put in practice is the, this science policy interfaces, and they will be operating all along the, the project. So that we aim and we are extracting from the first round of uh, activities in these interfaces, uh, the identification of interventions to, to be tested, to be analyzed along this uh, value chain approach from farmers to consumers. So that the, 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 the aim is, as I told you, to, to better understand, uh, to propose, to make contributions in terms of the design and the adoption of sustainable business models. And we are working with a number of sustainability outcomes. I mean, as I told, as, as I shown you in the, in the, in the case study uh, slide, we have uh, case studies about water, about biodiversity, about carbon and other that are cross catching uh, environmental uh, case studies. And that's all, I, I'm afraid I cannot Told you, uh, tell, tell you very much in terms of outcomes, but if you invite us uh, in two years, uh, I promise to be able to, to say something else. So we are now moving to to the, the climate adaptation issues, but at farm level, okay, only with uh, farmers through this uh, live project. 
So as you can see on this map, we, we try to, to build a partnership with um, four organizations covering different climate zones in, in Europe, in which you have uh, specific issues dealing with um, climate uh, stress and climate impact for, for the local farms. So three of the partners were NGOs like Solagro, and uh, we had also a university in Estonia in, the, in, the, in this uh, partnership. So the, the project is, is finished since um, the year 2020. But uh, as you will see at the end of my presentation, we continue to work on this with uh, post-life, let's say, uh, um, deliverables. So the main idea of this um, project was to work at farm level with uh, farmers, concrete farmers. So we try to organize a network of pilot farms in the, in the different countries. So we had uh, 126 pilot farms involved in, uh, so we had dairy farms, cereal, uh, cereal crops, uh, we had vineyards, uh, or tomatoes in, in Spain. So we had plenty type of farms and we had plenty type of, um, let's say farming practices. Of course, we had uh, conventional farms, but also organic and yes, irrigation, no irrigation. So we had plenty, a diversity of uh, farming systems. So the main ideas of the of this uh, pilot farm was to to use a common decision tool to in which we tried to organize some quantitative and qualitative information. So the idea was to 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 have um, a, a diagnosis of the the climate vulnerability. So we we try to organize climatic data of the past years to, to show what was the, the trends on the different uh, information, but also climate projection. And during 2016 and 2020, using climate projection at farm level was really a new information, a new tool. And we tried to, to organize a lot of um, work with the scientific communities producing this kind of data and to make it useful or end users, which are, are farmers, but also the yes, the all the advisors working at farm level. Um, we try to inject in this decision tool also all the information describing the the farm and how the farm is organized. And uh, one of the very important inputs are the different crop yield and the variability, the different historically of the crop yields to understand when we had bad results, uh, what was the relationship with, uh, with climate, climate hazards. Uh, we tried to also, um, so this decision tool was based on past data, but also trying to understand what uh, would be the, the new climate in the next uh, 20 or 30 years and to understand if uh, we had no change what would be the new reality, the new stress at farm level. So we had this, um, we organized a kind of a notation of the, the new issues uh, coming to each of the, of the farm. So during this, um, the interviews with farmers, we use this kind of uh, graphics with them to make them more concrete what was the coming years with uh, climate change and what uh, what is it locally so we try to go from climate data to agro climate data so we build uh, what we call agro, agro climate indicator here you've got an example of uh, its stress it's for um, a number of days per year of heat stress and this heat stress of course it's one of the issues for animals or for crops it depends on the, the time of the year the period and it's something really concrete to um, to get the um, for farmers to understand what could be uh, the issues of adaptation for them uh, at farm level so we try to organize the discussion during three years with the, the agriculture, the, the farmers to at the end produce 
an, adapt, um, an adaptation plan with the main uh, adaptation measures for them. But we really uh, work half of the time with them on this uh, second step to help them to be better understand what, uh, what is vulnerability for them at farm level and what it could be in the coming years through the climate uh, trends. So uh, we don't have so much time, but you would see we, we have a lot of variables in this project. So here are the, the resume, the main, uh, let's say the main uh, no regret adaptation uh, measures. So diversification is part of the, of the issues. Uh, we have uh, plenty of things to do with soil conversation and extensification of the farming practices. And we also put forward uh, a lot of issues with uh, the livestock, you know, the recos and um, are quite sensitive to its stress. And uh, for all these kind of farming system, there are a lot to do with, uh, with the thermal stress uh, of the, of the, of the cows. So the main variables of our project is this uh, web tool, AgriAdapt uh, web tool for adaptation. We try to organize it in three sections, three modules. Module one is uh, we, we saw during the projects that uh, to better adapt, uh, there's a big need with to, to improve the, the, the capacities of the farmers. So we have to strengthen the knowledge with climate, uh, what is climate change, what is climate change impact, and what is climate change adaptation in agriculture. So this uh, quiz is very, it's a good thing to, to, to get some knowledge. And you have four quiz, uh, four quiz, one for each of the climate zones. We have a second module with quantitative data with uh, what was the what is the climate on the different uh, yellow point you get on this map? Uh, what are the historic uh, variability of the yield of the different crops? And of course, we have also uh, some uh, information, a lot of information about uh, the climate projection for this local point. Uh, and the last uh, and third module consists in uh, showing different uh, options to adapt at farm level, and we were working in the framework of, of a life project. So we try to focus really on sustainable adaptation measures. So we don't know uh, when we need to adapt exactly and uh, what to do. But um, with this kind of measures, we can also show some other positive aspects concerning uh, environment. In the, um, so even if you don't, uh, if you are not impact with uh, climate stress, you can have some positive impact on different uh, parts of environment. So this uh, web tool is uh, online since uh, three years now, and it's still, uh, so you get uh, the, the link. Um, and uh, we, at the end of the project, we present the results to the Copernicus team uh, at, um, at the European level, and they were interested to, to put uh, let's say the, this um, AgriAdapt um, methodology in a specific application in the climate um, data store of the Copernicus. So I've got just uh, one or two slides to, to show you uh, how it looks like. So the idea is to, to have um, both historical time series and uh, climate projection. We have some indicators, not all of them, but a few ones dealing with its stress, average temperature and precipitation, frost days, uh, and uh, the date also of the last uh, spring's frost. And um, the very interesting thing is that you can also adjust some threshold, not all, but we give some place to the users to, 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 to have different uh, options. And, and it's the same thing with the period. So in agriculture, the very interesting thing when you are on a local farm is to adjust a period on the threshold so it can be relevant for you. So this, um, it's a free um, application. It's available through this web link and uh, it will look like this. It's very easy. You click somewhere on the map and you can uh, adjust then the different year variables. Of course, you the idea is to show the trends for different RCP scenarios, 
You can here adjust the threshold for its stress. You can adjust the period and then you will be the results for different time horizons. And you have both here the reality, for example, here the year, the year, uh, the, the recent years, we are with more uh, its stress, for example. Uh, it's show then here over the, um, the anomaly, um, the anomaly of the recent past uh, data. And here you have uh, both the, the current situation here and then the trend for the coming years and the need to move and to, to adapt at farm level. And uh, one more uh, post-life project that has been, uh, that is also now available. So we work with the partner on uh, our a common tool uh, for to, to have an easy access to climate projection. So it's available for all Europe. It's a multimodal approach. Uh, you can have results for the near future or the, the really far future. And the, the specificity of the tool, the innovation is here. You have 100 and 122 indicators uh, ready to use, but that are totally freely adjustable. So you can play with a lot of, of uh, indicators. It's relevant for, let's say, all the, the production. And uh, you can make local. Uh, so it's a uh, grid points uh, about uh, 10 kilometers square. And uh, when you work with farmers, they always want to have their situation. And the, the tool is available in five languages, so it's an easy way also to, to reach farmers. So that's it for the presentation. So in only a few minutes, you have four steps and you can have the results. So by this, you don't need to be a specialist of data or for climate projection. You can really have a local information with your agroclimate indicators for the, the near or the far future. Thank you very much.